What's the difference between an autobiography and a memoir? Well, it's, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. You probably uh, um, look, everyone has a book inside them, which is exactly where I think it should in most cases <laughs> uh, remain. That was writer Christopher Hitchens at a bookstore in Timonium, Maryland, December 15th, 1997, on a panel discussing political writing as a profession. It was one of 100 appearances Christopher Hitchens made on C-SPAN before his December 2011 death. In this episode of The Weekly, we mark 10 years since Christopher Hitchens died by remembering his many interviews and book talks on C-SPAN. A look back at Christopher Hitchens' most memorable C-SPAN moments after this. When Christopher Hitchens died at the age of 62 in 2011, the New York Times described him as a slashing polemicist in the tradition of Thomas Paine and George Orwell, who trained his sights on targets as various as Henry Kissinger, the British monarchy, and Mother Teresa. He displayed those characteristics during his September 1st, 1993 appearance on C-SPAN's Book Notes. He was honest and blunt about the creative value of hatred. For a lot of people, their, their first love is what they'll always remember. For me, it's always been the first hate. And I think that hatred, though it provides often rather junky energy, is a terrific way of getting you out of bed in the morning, keeping you going. It can be, if you don't let it get out of hand, it can be canalized into writing. And um, in this country where people like to be non-judgmental when they can be, which translates as on the whole lenient, there are an awful lot of bubble reputations floating around that you know, one wouldn't be doing one's job if one didn't itch to prick. Christopher Hitchens famously wrote and talked about people and institutions for whom he had low opinion. The New York Times obituary specifically listed Henry Kissinger, Mother Teresa, and the British monarchy. On September 5, 1997, he combined two of those targets, invoking Mother Teresa during a discussion of Princess Diana a few days after her death. Look at the front page of the Washington Times. The nuns admit shredding evidence is the lead story up here, but the continuing story of the week down here is royal family brings grief into public eye after much criticism. You've been on the telly, as they say, talking about this. What's your take at this point in the story? <coughs> if the top headline had referred to Mother Teresa's in the perfect front page from my point of view, um, as it is uh, two of my um, uh, least favorite forces, that's to say the, the lovers of Princess Diana and the lovers of the House of Windsor, are having a fight, so it couldn't be better. Um, I wish that's how it had been reported. Uh, only today did the thing begin to talk about of a news story, I mean, in other words, something that could actually be reported. For the whole of the rest of this week, we've been absolutely just drowning in drool, where the coverage has not been the coverage, objective coverage of an event but the sort of forced recruitment of everybody into the same emotional mold. A great, a great titanic outpouring of kitsch, in other words, where everyone is told that they're all part of a great we, and that this great we feels both bound together and enormously moved and hurt by something that actually is a non-event. Christopher Hitchens wasn't a fan of the Clintons either, but going back to the September 1st, 1993 book notes, he supported Bill Clinton's claim to be a moderate, in a personal and unique way. Uh, let's go back to uh, Oxford. Yes. Because in the book, you have a number of articles about then-candidate Bill Clinton. Yes. You went to Oxford at the same time. Mm -hmm. Did you know him there? No, I didn't. I knew the house where he lived, 46 Lakeford Road, quite well because it was a well-known hangout for um, American exile, usually Rhodes Scholar, but not always, uh, anti-war and pro-civil rights people and th those were my friends and I knew people who knew Bill Clinton and I still do know some of them and I remember the milieu very well and I remember we used to do all kinds of stuff to help out the American anti-war students who I think were being very brave at the time much braver than they're given credit for but I I'm sure I've looked at pictures of him at the time I'm sure I don't remember him who did you and in fact during the campaign I used to say to people I can prove to you Bill Clinton is a moderate as he claims because if he was an extremist I definitely would have known him Christopher Hitchens was particularly outspoken on the topic of religion, which he considered a dangerous threat. Britannica remembers him as, in their words, a British-American author, critic, and bon vivant, whose trenchant polemics on politics and religion positioned him at the forefront of public intellectual life in the late 20th and early 21st centuries. He appeared on C-SPAN's Book TV on September 2, 2007, to discuss his book, God is not great how religion poisons everything. In its obituary, 
The New York Times called the book a bestseller attacking religious belief. On book TV, he explained the roots for those attacks when he was asked who Mrs. Jean Watts was. Mrs. Jean Watts was uh, my, my nature and scripture teacher when I was eight until I was about 12 um, at a little boys boarding school in Devonshire. I'm one of those lucky ones who was sent off to boarding school at the age of eight. Made a man of me. And um, she was a fine old lady, a widow, um, with very little culture or education, but she could take us on nature walks, show us the beauties of nature. I used to be able to tell all kinds of tree, shrub, flower, plant. And then um, she would teach us scripture as literal truth, more or less. We'd have to go through the Bible. It's compulsory still in England to, to have religious education, instruction. And um, one day she overstepped her mark, vaulting ambition of Mrs. Watts, tried to fuse her two roles and discussing vegetation. She pointed out that it was largely green, which you'll have noticed too, and we had noticed. And she said this is an excellent thing and proof of the, of the glory of God because he could have made the vegetation orange or, or red or something that would really clash with our eyes, whereas green is the most restful color for our eyes and how, how on the whole very decent of God it was to make the trees and the flowers and the grass, not the flowers, but the trees and the grass that way. And I sat there in my little corduroy shorts and I thought that's absolute nonsense. I don't know anything at this point. I don't know about chlorophyll. Don't know about photosynthesis. Don't know anything about evolution, of course, or DNA. Nobody knew about the double helix then. But I know in my in my in my water, as it were, I know that that's not true. It's the other, if anything, it's the other way around. The eyes have adapted to the to the um, vegetation. So that was my first moment of, of thinking. I'm not sure I trust what the authorities are telling me about religion. While there were many people and ideas Christopher Hitchens strongly disliked. There were specific things in his life he embraced with vigor. Returning again to the September 1st, 1993 book notes, Mr. Hitchens was asked about the cover picture for another book of his called For the Sake of Argument. The picture showed him surrounded by cigarettes and glasses of liquor. This book has a picture, black and white picture on the cover of you um, sitting there with a cigarette in your hand. And uh, is it, I can't see where I am. Is that alcohol there in front of you? There are about nine or 10 empty glasses in front of me. Only two or three of them are mine, I hope it's clear. And, and I think only probably about two of them are filled or have just been emptied of booze. It's me slumped over a dinner table the night I got married, as a matter of fact, and Annie Leibovitz was there and took a picture of me, which I thought did actually look, for better or worse, pretty much like I do. Let's take a look at it again. Um, this your idea to put this on the cover? Well, partly it, it was because not everyone has the chance to have their picture taken by Annie Leibovitz. And second, because she is a genius photographer and she does capture what I'm like after about eight o'clock in the evening. And third is that one of the longer articles in the book is a defense of smoking and drinking and of alcohol and nicotine um, against the current sort of prohibitionist mentality that's sweeping the country. It's a, it's a sort of in your face reply to the new Puritanism. L that expression on your face. And I'm there. sitting here now, for example, thinking, how much I like these sorts of discussion and thinking, but if I just had a brandy and soda there and an ashtray, how much better a side of me you'd be seeing. You think that's you? Yeah, I'm afraid so. I have to face it. Like everyone else. I keep mentioning Orwell, but he says at the, I think he says at the age of 40, a man has the face he deserves. I won't see 40 again, so I guess I'm stuck with that now. In that Book Notes interview, Christopher Hitchens also described where he writes. Yeah, I sometimes write in bars too in the afternoons. In I, bars? Yeah, I go out and find the corner of a bar. I quite like, if the noise isn't directed at me, in other words, if it's not a phone ringing or a baby crying or something, I quite like it if the jukebox is on and people are shouting the odds about a sports game. I just hunched over a bottle in the corner, and I write in longhand anyway, so I can do it anywhere. In another C-SPAN appearance, on April 5th, 1996, Christopher Hitchens was shown another picture of himself. He was momentarily surprised. Then he circled back to drinking. Now, uh, Mr. Hitchens, have you seen this? There's a picture of you in here. This is the Washington Times, and they have you here. This is, looks like it's at a party of some kind. I have no. You have no idea, do you? No, none. None. Isn't it interesting? We can surprise you with this. Insider money. Bash proves great investment. This is something that you put on. It's a book about called Risky Business by Elizabeth uh, Lucenhop. Oh, yeah. Very good book. And what are you, you're talking to um, 
Uh, in this picture, Diana McClellan. Yes. Two Brits. Yes. Old enemy of mine. No, this is a very good book by a woman who was um, conned by Lloyds of London um, into becoming a name, as they call it. You put your name down as a prestige matter, you, you become an underwriter. Um, but you, uh, uh, alas, you'll, you also become liable. They don't tell you that bit. Here's Diana McClellan and uh, Michael Barone. Uh, who is Diana McClellan, by the way? You say an old enemy of yours? Yeah, uh, Diana McClellan used to write a terrible gossip column called The Ear in the Washington Post and then wrote it even worse in the Washington Times later on. An, an enemy of yours? And she, you... wrote a uh, she wrote a book called Ear on Washington to which I gave a bad review and she chose actually this very evening to have her revenge on me in her introductory speech. Fourteen years she'd waited to revenge herself for a bad review I gave her. It just goes to show. I mean, the town remembers. Well, it's flattering to think that, you know, someone's reading you, even if, it, even if they only read you when it's about yourself. Can I just have a quick look at the picture? Certainly. You haven't seen it. You didn't know it was coming. Yeah, it looks as if I look even, how even more sordid than I do this morning. How, how long ago <laughs> was this picture taken? Monday night, this was, in um, one of the... But one of Washington's better uh, joints, it's a, a, a bar specially consecrated to martinis and cigars. Christopher Hitchens' final C-SPAN interview was taped in his apartment on January 14, 2011. He died in December 2011 from complications related to cancer of the esophagus. On Q&A, he was asked if he thought his cancer wouldn't have happened without his lifestyle. So to answer your question, of course, I always knew that there's a risk in the bohemian lifestyle and I decided to take it because whether it's an illusion or not I don't think it is um, it helped my concentration it stopped me being bored it stopped other people being boring to some extent it would keep me awake it would make me want the evening to go on longer to prolong the conversation to enhance the moment if I was asked would I do it again um, the answer is probably yes. I'd have quit earlier, possibly, hoping to get away with the whole thing. Easy for me to say, of course. Not very nice for my children to hear. It sounds irresponsible if I say, yeah, I'd do all that again to you. But the truth is, it would be hypocritical of me to say, no, I'd, I'd never touch the stuff if I'd known. Because I did know. Everyone knows. And I decided all of life is a wager. I'm going to wager on this bit. And I, I can't make it come out any other way. Um, it, it's strange, I almost don't even regret it, though I should. Because it's just impossible for me to picture life without wine and other things fueling the company and, and keeping me reading and um, traveling and energizing me. It, it worked for me, it really did. And now, a bonus clip. More Christopher Hitchens but not from a C-SPAN interview. Instead, on stage at the DC Improv Comedy Club, competing in the Funniest Celebrity in Washington contest, November 3rd, 1999, Christopher Hitchens took a drag on his cigarette, drank heartily from his glass of liquor, attacked a few people, then he sang. I thought the real problem with Washington because if you laugh at a lot of these jokes, you know, it's like Mark Russell with the elephants and the donkeys, or <laughs> considering Herb a cartoonist, it's too, it's too sad making. <laughs> Have a little ditty about loneliness and what it's like to be ostracized and upset and unwanted. And it goes like this. It was early last September, as near as I remember, I was falling down the street in drunken pride when I fell into the gutter thinking thoughts I dare not utter and a pig came up and lay down by me side as I lay there in that gutter thinking thoughts I dare not utter a fair young maid came by and she did say you can tell a man who boozes by the company he chooses and at that, the pig got up and walked away. <laughs> and the pig got up, slowly walked away. Because what I think you see, maybe, thank you. You're very good, you're very kind. You're most kind, you're most kind. That's it for this episode of C-SPAN's The Weekly. A reminder that you can do your own searches in the C-SPAN video library. Just go to cspan.org and use the search bar on top. You can find more Christopher Hitchens interviews 
And if you watch the program where he performed at the DC Improv in 1999, you might even find him sharing the stage with your podcast host, who also competed in the Funniest Celebrity Contest that year with some extreme comedy. Thanks for listening, and happy searching. <laughs>